So, so get started. Right. So today we're going to be talking about building a RESTful API with Scala Z. So how many of you know what Scala Z is? Okay, there's one. All right. So so I'm Yashwant Kumar. I'm a platform engineer, Megum Systems. So we are a startup. We are a, we are a cloud startup from Chennai, and uh, so we are like. So it's a past platform where you could launch applications, services, and you bind them together. Something like Heroku, but we also do the monitor them, and you have continuous integration, all this stuff, right? So the agenda is pretty simple. So we will look into Scala Z library, quick intro on Scala Z library, and then um, like what it is uh, and how to use it. And then REST API, the, the gateway, the architecture of the API server. Okay, so this API server, so say R is a cloud platform. So we have an API, an API server that takes, that does the full heavy lifting there. Okay, so it's, it's a loosely coupled architecture. So we have this API which does pretty much everything. From the it's a rails on top, we have this API and it's connected to a, you know, a, a message broker and then a pass engine and stuff. So this does pretty much all the work. So we got so that is written with Scala Play, and we've used Scala Z library to work with. And yeah, so I'll also show you some real-time use case of Scala Z, like basically the code of how we wrote it and stuff. So why functional? Okay, yeah. So why functional? Right. So we know software is getting complex. As in, as it gets really complex, you know, you want the software to be well structured. Right? So, and then, well, we all know that immutability. So we all know that there are no assignment statements in when you're writing functional code, right? So you don't, so it's immutable, right? And, fine, side effects. So we, we all know functional programming is all about not having any side effects. So what do you mean by side effects? So say, say there's a function, Okay, it takes in a type A, it gives a result B, that's it, right? So it doesn't do anything else, it's that straight, straightforward, it takes a type A, gives a type B, that's it. So in, so what happens is that you won't have any side effects, okay? And there are no order of execution, so it, it, it's irrelevant. I mean, you could do whichever order you want, basically that particular function is going to do one thing, right? That's it. It's pretty elementary stuff. I mean, just anyway. So, pure functions. You all know what pure functions is, right? Something that has no side effects, something that has immutable, uh, and something, yeah, something that's well structured. So that's that's a pure function. Like I said, A gives type B. Right. And all this gives you concise code. Like I said, if it's well structured, it's got the code going to be concise. And if the code is concise. It increases readability. So any programmer who comes up, so you know functions are so small, like your controller, whatever you write, it's going to be like a few lines of code. And well, first, when you look at the code, it's going to be a little hard to understand. But once you, you know, sort of know how functional programming and everything works, because it's a real time, this is an actual experience which I had. So once you figure out how it all works, it's going to be so simple for you to work on top of it. Okay. So today, oh yeah, and last one, because it's fun. It's a new paradigm, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say functional programming is better or anything like that. It's just purpose driven. So you want to build something for that particular purpose, you pick that and you choose and you do it. And you see with what that you always have trade-offs. So something does something better than the other thing. So you pick for whatever you know it's whichever use case it's suitable for. Okay. So okay, I think I've messed up the that slide. Thingy because I was doing a lot of changes at the last minute. So come on. All right. So some of function FP with Scala, like all well, Scala people, they know what it, what it is, right? Okay. So quick introduction of Scala. How many of you code in Scala? Great. Okay. So Scala is an object-oriented language. It also supports functional programming, right? And then uh, it compiles to JVM. We all know that, right? So, but why Scala is suitable to write pure functional code, right? Why Scala is suitable for that matter is 
It has first class, it suppose first class function. Fine. Immutable collection library, right? Supports pattern matching. Now every language supports pattern, ma pattern matching, like they, like across everything, just, I don't know, they have pattern matching now. So pattern matching, right? So Scala is like the perfect language to, but the problem is when you start, if you want to write, func like you take Haskell, it's easy to write because you have to be pure. You don't, you don't have a choice. But with Scala, that's not the case. You can actually sort of, if you want to write pure, fun you want to write pure functional way, you can't. You might just abuse it and then, you know, start writing in a different way. So, so that's where Scala Z comes in. Scala Z helps you code in pure functional way, right? So, let's see what a map is. So, a map is basically say you have a function which, given an end, it it returns a list of whatever increment of one. Okay. So you create a list which has one comma two, it's a list over there, and you map it, apply the function, you get a list of list two, list three. Right, you know, you all know what a map is, right? Fine, so now flat map, it's pretty similar. So what flat map does is, you take a list of one comma two, and then you, you apply it, it flattens the inner type. List of list two comma list three would become list of two comma three. Do you follow? Right? So this is the basic introduction of, of functional, like how Scala supports functional programming, right? So we'll move on. Yeah, so this is, I don't know, I mean, a lot of people actually sort of whenever I tell them to pick up Scala Z or I try to, you know, help them, yeah. Okay, it's like you could um, sort of, okay, you could put the function in a value and you could carry it over anywhere in the place as, as a value, right? So it's like, see, I don't know, see, I'm not an expert, but how I see it, how I see functional programming is that, just a personal, is that you could sort of do, put everything in a value and carry it over, carry it everywhere, right? So you could. So everything is basically a value, could, right? So it's, it's a lot easier for you to, in, in terms of error handling, in terms of you know passing functions, right? It helps. It helps a lot. So, so yeah. So Scala Z is a library to write functional code. It's it's an, actually an extension from the code library to write functional code, and uh, it's not hard. I mean, if you if you get into all monads and all that stuff, I mean, if you theoretically you could, I mean, a lot of people keep telling you know. Honestly, I don't know, but how I see it is that I just look at the library and see, you know, it's a particular type class, how can you possibly use this in the code and try to solve a particular problem. Maybe, maybe, you know, it's an iterative process, maybe tomorrow or day after I would probably learn how it actually works internally. And does not require superhuman power. So, so yeah, type classes, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> we just start with type classes. So what is type class? So. It's right there. So type class A, okay, it, it's not a class, like how an object programming, right, let me just put that in. Uh, so type class A defines some behavior in a form of operations, okay, which is supported by type class any type, T, okay. Then type T is a member of type class A. We'll look at examples now. I mean, it's, it's pretty confusing, but look at examples now. Right, so this is like the hollow world of Scala Z, I mean, like, talk about Say you have, so you, op you fire up REPL and then you type a string, any string, you put an equal to operator to one, it's going to compile and it's going to give you, it's going to say, I mean, it's going to compile, it's going to give a bool fall, right? But that shouldn't, that shouldn't happen, right? So, but in Scala Z, you import Scala, okay, that's Scala Z, I mean, it's actually going to give you compilation error, okay? Note, the type needs to be the same, right? Fine. So this is like a simple example, now order type class. So this is another type class. So this is the very weird, uh, Scala has a lot of weird symbols, like for either or, they have this backward slash, forward slash, and for order, they have this question mark, pipe question mark, right? So what this basically is, pretty, it's pretty simple. So you put three, that, two, right? So it's gonna, it supports like greater than, less than, 
max, min, and all that stuff. So three, so it, it's, it's gonna actually compile and give you GT because it's greater than, right? But if you change the type, you give a string, so you put three, two, it's gonna throw a compilation error. Note, a type. So type needs to be, right? Yeah. Uh, the triple equal to is basically the equal operator in Scala zero. Is it, 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 it's, it's another way of double equal also, but yeah, but uh, but you you can actually use that. Say, for instance, you want to check an equal to, like, see, uh, how do I? These are no, you do. See, okay, that's the thing is you put triple equal to and you actually do so. Say when you're, you write an equality, right, and you actually check, right, whether, and it's gonna throw an error at compile time itself. Do you, do you follow? I think I didn't put enough code. So, show, show type class, it's just, uh, well, so a new thread of show is actually gonna, it's gonna throw an error, so you, you put an implicit value of show, shows of thread and get name, and now you put new thread of show, it's actually gonna throw the name. So these, these are just small, simple type classes which you can use on your, on your on your code. So the reason, the point I'm trying to make here is adding type safety becomes a lot, I mean type, you get, your code becomes type safe. That's the whole point of, uh, the, the whole, you know, the examples is, it becomes a lot, it becomes type safe. So what happens is you figure out the bugs in the compile time itself. Which is great, right? That's something great. Okay, so let's get into lens. Oops. Right. So we talk about. Okay, we all know getter and setter, right? Yeah. Okay. So we talk about lens. Well, getter is fine, but setter. Excuse me. I mean, everything is immutable here. You can't set something. I mean. It, nothing much, it's basically you create another value, that's it. So you write a lens, it pretty much sort of makes another, creates another value, creates another object, inserts another object and creates another value. So it puts, it puts up another value, that's about it, right? But as you can see here, so as a case class playlist takes artist and ranking, so we create Paul and Ringo over there and then you actually create a rate lens, okay? A rate lens, that's a lens, so lens dot lensu of, you give a base type, and a uh, field, field type, okay? So that's basically playlist and int. And you basically copy, use a copy and then you change it. So what happens is, when you use it over here, increment set rate set of that setter, it, bakes, it, bakes, it basically creates and stores in the value, that's about it, right? And that's another weird uh, operator in, yeah, so that basically increments by one. Okay, this might look simple, this might, you might just ask what is the big deal, you just, you know, instantiate and then you just throw in a value, what's the big deal? But, it helps to compose multiple lenses, I'll show you how. So, you can have two lenses, a dress lens and a, and a street lens, and you also, have, you also have a person street lens, right? So, uh, lens of person, that, that, that's, the, it's actually lens, okay, I've not, I've put the code in a much smaller way. So, and then you compose this. Street lens, compose, are this lens. Now, you can actually apply getter and setter. Can you see it? People, street L, get person. You actually get it. Person, street L, set. You follow? So say you have, say you have a nested data structure and you have a key, right? You can't take it out, I mean, it's, it's, it, it gets clumsy. But with lenses, you could, Compose and take it out. Like you have a, so you have a map of map, right? So you you have a key, you can sort of take the like you can use that lens and other lens inside compose together and then take a particular value for a key, right? So yeah, so that's basically bidirectional transformation. So you make transformations. That's it, basically it. And, yeah, so a neat way of updating deeply nested data structure, right? So you don't, it doesn't get clumped, you can get set, 
update, change using multiple languages. Right. So validation. Okay, let me just. Okay. So validation. If I don't talk about validation, I mean, I, th I think that's like the most most used when it comes to Scala Z, as far as I know. So it's pretty good. Uh, it's it's pretty simple also. Say you have object, fun times, extensions, to essentials. Now what we are basically doing here is, by the way, that's a for comprehension. I'm sure all the Scala people know what what a for comprehension is, right? Yeah. Okay. So you basically check food, check booze, check gasoline, and everything is fine. You yield, right? Okay. Now how do you? Uh, so how do you? The basically validation is left and right. So the left is the failure, and the right is the success. Okay, you could like left map, flat map, take the value out. So, right? Okay. Now, say you, now all three is fine. All three things, all three are there, checking everything passes, it's going to yield. Fine, you're good to go. Say, check food, there, there is a problem, it throws an error. Okay? Now, okay, check food is fine, check booze is fine. Now, gasoline is not there. It's going to throw an error and it's going to fail, it's going to exit right there. Okay? But a problem with just validation. Now say you have two failures, like check boost or check gasoline, and say and the gasoline, or say there is gasoline, but it's less than particular amount, or there are two failures basically happening, two failures happening in that particular function. But what happens is when the first one, when the when the first failure comes, it fails, it fails fast. Okay. But what if what if you want to aggregate all the failures and give it to the user? I mean, you don't want to throw exceptions. You want to aggregate all the failures and give it to the user, right? So use something called validation nil. So it's a non-empty list. Okay. So validation nil is pretty much the same thing, but only thing is you put them in a non-empty list, a singly linked linked list to aggregate all the errors. Okay. So an, applic an applicative builder. How many of you use an applicative builder? Okay. So that's it's it's pretty it's pretty similar to well when you're using applicative it's pretty similar to sort of uh, a for comprehension right what you can do is say over here we can actually change that and write it this way pack food dot two validation nil two validation nil is actually a helper method which converts it converts it and sends it as a non empty list that's it so what happens here is it will return a non empty list of no food no liquor right so you could Use that applicator builder and you know build it. So that's validation nil. We look into an actual uh, example like how validation nil is used on on the on the server API server. So let's move to the overall architecture. So it's it's pretty simple. We have a front end like I said, and we have a Ruby wrapper, and then API, and then that's our API gateway server, right? We use React. And we use Snowflake ID that creates UID, uh, it generates the time, the timestamp, it generates a unique ID to and stores it and you know. So yeah, and how it all started? It all started actually when we wrote, yeah, so when we wrote, uh, we start, when we want to write an API, right? So we just chose Play and we chose Scala. We were never into, we never thought of writing with Scala Z. But we were moving to React, a NoSQL database. And when we actually use Scalia, Scalia is a library by the Stack, Stack Mob guys, and it was pretty good. And that's when we were forced to sort of use Scala as a library, and we actually liked it. We implemented a, a layer on top of it, a library on top of Scalia, which actually talks to our code, and that's when we actually started using Scala Z. Actually, I, I you know it's actually called Scala Z, but I like it to call it Scala Z. Uh, fine. So let's talk about the gateway server. Okay. So what happens? So you know, uh, from the front end, you have an HMAC, right? And what you do is you check before even before it gets in the controller, you check whether you know that it matches with 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 the with the one in the in the database, and then it allows the person, whatever. So we play to use a stackable controller, and we were just, you know, trying to build. Remember, we were not using Scala Z here yet. Okay. So we were like using a lot of traits, and then we decided to remember this is like the first entry 
this is like the first, you know, whenever you, so basically the controller, right? So you call the controller. Now we removed all, we were able to remove all the traits and actually use stack action. Now what happens, what stack action basically does is that uh, you could, uh, what, so there is something before, okay, there's something called, we have a transport layer. That's basically a funnel request and a funnel response. Okay, are you lost? Sir? Okay. Basically a funnel request and a funnel response. Okay. So what happens, so anything that comes in, it gets funneled. It gets funneled into, you know, whatever data you feed into it, it gets funneled and, it, you know, put in the proper, so that it, it goes on to the rest of our API, from the controller to the models to the database. Okay. So stack action basically checks, it checks whether that user is, it's an, it's an odd, right, it checks whether the user is right or wrong, or whatever, it authenticates them, and then the process goes forward. So that's just a simple, and then yeah, it calls the model. So this is what happens when you do, when you do auth action. So we've, we've written, we've overwritten a, a, a method, and what happens is, the request comes in, okay, uh, implicit, we have, we have an implicit function which actually builds a funnel request builder, right, and then it calls this authenticated function, and this is where we've used validation L, right, we, have used, we would have used validation L everywhere, pretty much. So everywhere, anywhere we call, we get validation L of, so we get a left map and a flat map. We either get a failure or a success, okay? And you can see request funneled, since it's a funnel request build, it gets request funneled, and if it's success, it does checks in, you know, and if it's a failure, it just throws a validation of failure of the string, okay? So, yeah, so let's look into how we've used it, like in a more, Full. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's how you. So account of result. That's our model right there. So account of result is basically a case class, and. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the account model, right? So you get an email, you get an input, and returns validation of throwable option of event result. Okay. So event result is a case class. This is just some event data. And we call something called GunnySack, okay? So GunnySack is basically another function. What it does is that it takes the data, it it marshals and marshals, like serialization, it, it, it takes the data, add as the UID or whatever, and then gives a GunnySack, a GunnySack type, okay? As you can see there, MK GunnySack or whatever, you left map and you check whether you're getting any error. And you get an error, you actually throw service on every error, okay? And, and two validation L, you send back to validation L. And if you don't, you actually flat map and take the option of Ganesha on the line, on line four. You follow? Right? Now you actually have a Ganesha object and you actually store it in the database. React.store, js.get. Once you store it, you again check. You actually do a left map and check whether you, you're getting any error. And you flat map and uh, you match and you extract to events results. You follow? So that extract, okay, that extract over there, what happens, it's basically it's serialization, you know, what it does is that it takes and it parses it, you know, writer, we have a reader and a writer method, right? But one good thing here is that you have to get a validated schema. So you can't just store junk into your database, okay? So, so yeah, if it's sum, you get sum and you send it dot sum dot success null. So you basically turn, so the extract event result dot sum, change it into an option, success null, you actually send it to the right side. Right? Okay. So this is the gunny sack we're talking about. So, so when you get the model right, so that the input, the data is given to the gunny sack over here. We get the email, the input again. It throws, like we said, we did a flat map over there, right? Gets the data. As you can see, val of events input, validation l. It actually parses the input, and extracts it to events input. Okay. So now you're getting a data. You're getting a bunch of data, and you're actually extracting it to an, to a case class. Okay, use a for comprehension to chain, you do a chain of computation and you get the UIR, the 
the ID, and then you yield it. You set an index for the for the React for the database, and then you create another uh, you create a case cast case cast, and then you two JSON. You call the two JSON, right? So what happens when you call two JSON, and then you send it back? So over there, we, like we saw previously, we take the Gunnysack. So left map, if it throws an error, fine, you throw it. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna tell the user. Right? If it doesn't, you're gonna go ahead storing it because you have a perfectly built ob Gunnysack object, right? We follow, right? So that basically, you can see the fourth line to flat map. You get an option of Gunnysack. That's what is the the one which is returned here, over there. Follow, right? So. So yeah, so what does 2JSON do? Talking about JSON serialization, that's the that's the imports we do, that's the Scala Z. Uh, so we have a case class called events results and the 2JSON function there, right? So if you see, we have an event result serialization that invokes that and then you have an implicit override writer and a reader, okay? So as you can see, the reader, it gets an events results, it converts, actually, the thing is that it, it would go along, I mean like val ID, ID and whatever data you give, right? You could keep adding to it and just put it, made it smaller. And event results and it changes. J object, J object, J field, and it checks. Okay? We use the lift Scala Z library the framework that's there. I mean, we just use that library. And then uh, the reader is basically you get a J value. You've used you've used applicative builders there, and then you've created a new event result. Right? So this is basically marshaling, unmarshaling. Uh, yeah, they do, but uh, well, what we do here is we make sure the schema is validated. Okay, yeah. So, see, the thing is, we have predicted val ID key, right? Mm -hmm. So it checks when you when you're converting it. When you get an event result, it actually checks ID key to JSON or whatever. So you put in a J, J field and you actually check whether you know it's getting. So you you can't put junk value into database. That's about it. Well, you could you could do it, yeah. That's it's possible, but well, it, it the thing is, it's it's easy to also build on build on it, and we just found it easier to sort of do with it. So the either, so yeah, it's pretty. You know, if you know what an either in Scala is, right? So you could take a left and a right, and then the left and a right, and that's a simple example there. But in Scala Z, it has that backslash forward slash symbol for either. And it support and it, it implements is is left is right swap uh, get or else get or else is what we used before. It basically gets the it flat maps and or else what you need to do get the right part or else what you need to do success or what you need to do. Let's do that. And this is okay. So this is so we this is actually like a far comprehension, but uh, we use sort of either T. And we, you know, like what we do there is we get accounts that find by email. We get the email, and then we, you know, calculate the HMAT, the one we saw there, the basic, the full authentication of how it happens, right? That authenticated actually calls this. The thing is, I put it in the last because it has a for comprehension. It's, it's pretty. So yeah, so the calculated HMAT it checks, and if the authorization is successful, dot sum changes into option, right? Non implicit throwable, pure I/O. Okay, and if it's not successful, it's going to throw in. Authenticated error, authentication error. That's about it. So, so yeah. I mean, you can shoot me a lot of questions, but yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Like you know, just still looking up. Like I've not even implemented lenses. Still figuring out, figuring you know, figuring way ways to use it. So, so that's about it. I mean, right? No questions. Thank you.